All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome into the season premiere of season five here of Three Up, Three Down. Our topic here today and for the next three weeks uh, is going to be on the habits of successful plate umpires. So we'll get to break down some of the things that uh, I think most uh, that, w that we think that most um, successful plate umpires exhibit and I break down that in video and some some uh, theories and things like that. So real excited here, uh, kind of moving away from the rule study, which was obviously our point of focus in the last several weeks. Um, and probably more so to give you guys something to think about and potentially work on um, on the diamonds. Now, before we go ahead and get in with announcements and things like that, uh, to kind of preface this, and I'll probably say this over, over the course of the duration of today, we're going to give a lot of stuff with regards to strategy uh, on the strike zone and, and things like that. So as we're going through things today, I think it is important to, yes, take it all in. But if you start to try and implement everything all at once, you're going to start to lose track of where exactly you may be. So, you know, in the conversation here today and as we go through the week, just kind of come into it, yes, with an open mind, but also with the realization that, number one, you're probably doing a lot of these things already. And then secondly, if you try and do everything at once, it's going to be a heck of a lot for you to go ahead and try and balance. You'll be all over the place and not feel as comfortable or confident as you may otherwise would. So that's a big topic and kind of a disclaimer here right out of the gate. Now, before we go ahead and talk about the, uh, the, the strike zone strategy and things like that here today, just a couple of announcements. Obviously, Little League came out this week and talked about the cancellation of their upper level tournaments. It'll just be Little League Baseball and Little League Softball. Disappointing news, discouraging news for a lot of us. Uh, so I just encourage everybody to kind of rally around each other. Uh, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made by your fellow umpires and obviously that in Little League Baseball. And remember, one of our point of emphasis here is to be a supportive teammate. And that's not only to uh, the individuals that may have lost opportunity this year and have to wait until 2022 yet again, but it's also with the organization which we serve. So just keep that in mind here uh, as we're moving forward. And, you know, people have to make some tough decisions as we all have in the last year and a half. Um, and Little League is obviously no different. And it's an organization that we all love. We all love each other. Um, and it's going to maintain. And we just got to make sure that we stay, stay together and stay united as disappointed or discouraged as we may be. So lean on each other um, and, and find, find support in one another there. Uh, secondly, that means then that 2021, as we've kind of talked about, is the year to really sharpen your habits and skills and fundamentals so that when 2022 comes here now, you know, all that stuff is second nature. So what a yet another great opportunity for us to continue to think about those, those focal points um, and things like that that we've issued to just really boil things down to the basics, as we're going to talk about here today. Pick a couple small things to work on, and you never know when those will pay dividends down the road. So a really good opportunity in front of us here moving forward in 2021. Last announcement I've got is kind of more for the Central Region folks. If you guys saw on the Central Region Umpire Facebook page, uh, Brian Wild and his alumni team have posted the alumni breakfast stuff. Uh, for the week of the regional tournament. And although there will be no public attendance at the regional tournament, I think that situation will be separate. So uh, take a look at our Facebook page for the flyer on that. Uh, John Ignacio and Brian Wild are the two individuals to contact with them. Again, that'll be completely independent of the regional tournament. There's no public attendance at the regional tournament. So um, if that factors into your decision to come and participate in Alumni Weekend, make sure that you're aware that there's no public attendance this year, unfortunately, uh, at the regional tournament game. So those are the things here that I've got for us here announcement-wise so far for us today. Now, I'll go ahead and transition then into taking a look at the content for us today, and that is then uh, on strike zone strategy. And specifically, we'll focus into two different areas. Number one, the importance of our pre-pitch routine, and then secondly, proper use of eyes, and how the two of those basically go together to give us strategy here. So that's exactly uh, where we are headed here today. Now, I'll go ahead and get um, uh, everything lined up here. Let me go ahead and share my screen with everyone here. Um, so we'll get to the right page here for us. Um, and then start to talk a little bit about this. Now, this, as I mentioned, is a three-part series. So here's kind of the three parts here for us. Uh, today in episode one, as I mentioned, it's all about strike zone strategy, specifically that pre-pitch routine and our proper use of eyes. Next week, we'll take a look at the efficient movements from behind the plate, uh, which will be really interesting to see um, uh, whether or not we're wasting or maintaining movements that are appropriate. And then last one, some game management strategies uh, for us to talk about. So that's our three-parter here in May. Take the last weekend off as we all get ready to enjoy uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, but that is what is in front of us here. Now, as I mentioned, strike zone strategy is our focal point here today. So the first thing that I want to do here as we have this conversation is think about the word strategy. All right, so that's, that's, that's where I want to start. And in talking about strategy, I think it's important for us to realize that a strategy by definition here, if you looked it up, it's just an action plan to accomplish a goal. It is an action plan to accomplish the goal. So the goal then here of our strike zone, many people would say, is to be consistent. And while that may be true, I would probably argue, and many theories out there would argue, is that maybe it's not consistency that we're after here in our strike zone strategy, 
but rather it should be accuracy. That's kind of the first thought or the first philosophy here behind this. Are we fighting for accuracy versus consistency? And ultimately what many people would argue is that if your goal is accuracy, ultimately you are going to be consistent. So ultimately the uh, whole thought process here is that accuracy is more important than consistency here in terms of what exactly we're trying to accomplish. So that's the first kind of point here for us to think about as we start to think about strike zone strategy. Now, what the strategy relies upon is that action plan. So the goal, as I mentioned, is a accurate, fair strike zone. So in order to get there, number one, yes, you got to know what the strike zone is. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But at the same time, our fundamentals have to set us up to be able to see the strike zone correctly. So the consistency at which we attack the way we set up into our stance and the way that we get in and set, that's going to affect how we perceive the zone and ultimately set us up to be able to call a fair and accurate strike zone. The second thing then here is the other point then that we'll talk about today, that's proper use of eyes. And that is what allows us then, and we'll talk about tracking and things like that, to process the information necessary to, as I mentioned, called a fair and accurate strike zone. But I think big picture wise for us moving forward, it kind of two things to think about here. Number one, strategy is an action plan to accomplish our goal. And our goal is a fair and accurate strike zone more so than it is a consistent strike zone because a bad zone can be consistent. Um, so we're after a fair and accurate strike zone. And then in order to get there, our action plan is to be great in our habits of pre-pitch fundamentals. So that's our stance basics and then be great in our use of eyes. So those are kind of the two different uh, categories for us to look at. Now, as I mentioned before we started today, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to throw out there here with these fundamentals. Some of us, this is second nature. So like, just check it off the box that you're doing it. Some of us, we've got a lot to incorporate. So what's important to realize here as we start this conversation is that there's going to be a lot of information and we want to take it all in, yes. But when you go back out on the diamond, you can't apply everything. It'll be like trying to do everything at once. You'll lose track of it and not be able to apply what you want to and not feel like you're making any progress. So I always tell umpires when they take a look at these things, you know, pick one, two, or maybe even three. No more than three things to think about uh, and try and implement as you start to work. Make those habits and then start to move on. So take some time, take it in, and again, one step at a time here as we talk about strike zone strategy. Now, Pre-pitch routine is kind of the first element of strike zone strategy. Why is it such a big deal? Well, number one, it's what positions us successfully then and puts us in rhythm. And if our habits are great, then that gives us a chance to call a fair and accurate strike zone. But if our habits are not consistent with how we approach the strike zone, we don't give ourselves a chance. Uh, obviously, many of you guys know that I coach basketball. Um, and I coach college basketball at Denison University. And we talk a lot about our shooting habits and things like that. Well, if you think about a free throw shooter, he goes through a routine and that routine puts him in a system of rhythm, of comfortability so that his shot is consistent, that his mechanics are consistent so that his shot is accurate. And that's exactly what we're trying to look at here with umpiring. So our approach to our plate stance has to be consistent. That's this pre-pitch routine in between pitches in order for us to be able to call our goal that fair and accurate strike zone. Remember, confidence comes from comfort and comfort comes from our habits. So we've got to make sure that our habits and routines, the way that we step into the stance in between pitches, is probably the fundamental building block in order to have a, a good strike zone and ultimately call that fair and consistent strike zone, that fair and accurate strike zone that we're after. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our pre-set mechanics. So there's kind of four different areas here that we'll talk about in terms of building uh, our pre-pitch routine. And the first one is what exactly do you do in between pitches? So let's take a look here at a couple things here with regards to our pre-pitch cadence. Now, as I started to watch a lot of folks umpire, uh, I kind of came away with three different preset positions. And this is what we do in between pitches. And what we do in between pitches has to be consistent because, again, doing so sets us up for the ability then to go ahead and call a fair and accurate strike zone. So there are people that may be the standing, not the standing, the standing preset position. Some people may spread their feet first and then set and drop into their stance. Others then work hands on knees. And I've got some clips here for us too. So my question is, you know, what exactly do you do in between pitches and where does it fall in the realm of routine and consistency? Because remember, we want it to be consistent so that we have a better shot at calling that fair and accurate strike zone. So there are three different options. I'm sure that there's more that we can do. But again, the purpose of this is to kind of see, you know, number one, just how well these umpires execute this fundamental, how consistent it is. And then that then is what sets them up to be able to call a fair and accurate strike zone. So here's the standing set. The process here is that they're going to set the, the uh, drop foot first. And the drop foot in this case is this umpire's left foot, the one that's closest to the hitter. You'll see this umpire sets this one first 
and then sets his his uh i'm sorry he sets his slot foot i'm, I'm talking out of turn this slot foot the one that's closest to the hitter the slot foot the one that's closest to the hitter the drop foot the one behind the the, the the catcher here so we set the slot foot first the one that's closest to the hitter and then we set the drop foot which is the one uh closest to the catcher now again he's a standing set guy as we see this come about here again he's going to stand right there as the pitcher goes into his or her delivery we set the slot foot first and then the drop foot and you can see here the mechanics of this umpire are consistent on every pitch. Now also note where exactly he's lined up. He always finds himself lined up in the slot. Head height and everything else is typically great. We'll talk about that stuff here as we move on down the road. But again, what's important to realize here is that this fundamental building block starts with what we do in between pitches. And this preset position of the standing set, exemplified by this umpire here, gives us a good idea of one way that we can be consistent in between pitches. A second example of a preset position we can use is our spread, uh, our set spread and drop. So basically we're gonna set our feet, spread our legs, and then ultimately drop into our stance. So here is Seth at the World Series, at the uh, Little League Softball World Series in 2018. You can see that he has set his feet. And again, he set his slot foot first, drop foot second, spreads out, and then he's gonna drop at the proper time. And again, this is gonna be consistent on every pitch. Here he is putting the ball back in play you see that he's already spread his feet. So he set his feet and he spread his feet. He's ready for this one as we go to the next camera angle, and then he drops at the proper time. And again, these are all fundamentals in between pitches that we have to do in order to give ourselves a chance to be successful at calling a fair and accurate strike zone. New umpire, same routine, okay? Counts given, we spread our feet, we set our feet, we slot foot first, then the drop foot, and then we go ahead and drop into our stance as the pitcher goes ahead and begins his or her delivery. There's another option of consistency in between pitches that allows this umpire to position effectively to position for a fair and accurate strike zone. The last one's the hands on knees. A lot of people use this one and stay locked in. Some people readjust. Here's a good look at it. So we're hands on knees in between pitches. This allows us to take a second to, to, to refocus and, and get back set. Hands on knees there as the pitcher delivers. We may reset if the catcher resets. And then we drop back down by the time that the uh, pitcher's uh, uh, free foot is back down on the, on the ground. Another example here, hands on knees here pre-pitch. Uh, the pitcher goes into his or her motion. We reset if the catcher resets. And then we're locked in here by the time that the free foot drops back down to the, uh, to the ground. Okay, so a couple different things here that we can do in our preset stance that have to be consistent in order for us to even have a shot at going ahead and calling it a fair and consistent strike zone or a fair and accurate strike zone. DJ, anything in the chat or anything like that here for us to talk about here so far? Nope, all good. Keep it going. All right. So that's the first kind of step and the first thing to think about is what do we do in between pitches and how consistent are we in our preset? Because that preset, again, sets us up to be able to perceive the strike zone effectively from the right position. Now we'll talk about the slot and slot positioning here as I continue on through things today, but we want to talk about building it from the ground up. So we started there with the whole idea of what do we do in between pitches to set us up. The second thing is our footwork. So we've got to make sure that we're aware then here of how we build our, our feet from the ground up. Now I made this statement here, the slot foot and the drop foot, which one should we place first? Well, remember that the slot foot is the one closest to the hitter. Okay. The slot foot is the one closest to the hitter. The drop foot is the one closest to the batter. I'm, just, I'm sorry, closest to the catcher. My goodness, I'm, I'm struggling today. So slot foot, one closest to the hitter, drop foot, the one closest to the catcher. So the question is, which one do we want to place first? And for the most part, the, the answer here in, in philosophy and theories out there is that we want to place the slot foot first because oftentimes that results in us being more aggressive or better positioned in the slot. So many people want to set the drop foot first because they want to like split the back end of the catcher. Well, that doesn't necessarily do us any favors in making sure that we're in the slot, which is kind of that fluid midpoint between the batter, the inside of the batter, and the catcher. So we want to position that slot foot first. That'll get us lined up with the hitter and then kind of find that midpoint, that nice midpoint between the hitter and the, the, the catcher. And then that's where we'll go ahead and find our slot. So we'll find we'll just, we want to uh, go ahead and position our slot foot first and then go ahead and set our drop foot. And that then the reason why is because that has a tendency to make us more aggressive in the slot. Now there are three heel toe relationships to go ahead and form. And I'm sure many of us have, have talked about heel toe before. And I've got a picture out there for us as well. The first one's with ourself. And sometimes 
People want to work uh, heel toe, which is fine. Sometimes we shorten up or, or, or kind of more parallel that stance to heel instep. That's um, acceptable as well. What we don't want to see is a super pronounced stance because oftentimes that um, that alters our our, our, um, our our squaredness to the release point of the pitcher, which affects depth perception, particularly on the outer edge. So we don't want to get any more pronounced with our feet in alignment other than heel toe uh, or heel instep. And we'll see some examples of that here uh, once I get to some of the video. So that's the first heel toe relationship to maintain with our footwork that with ourself, we want to be then heel toe. The other relationship here too is heel toe with the catcher. And this is to afford freedom of movement for the catcher as well. So if we take a look at the diagram, you can see the heel of the catcher. That's where our toe, our front toe should be of our slot foot. Okay? And that gives us proper distance between us and the catcher and affords freedom of movement for the catcher as well. Now again, notice that our foot should be heel toe or heel instep, which means that our drop foot is slightly behind our, um, uh, our slot foot, so our drop foot is slightly behind the slot foot. That means then that we're gonna have freedom of movement here for the catcher if he decides to turn, throw the ball back, or turn and block something as well. So not only does that help us kind of perceive the strike zone in the slot, does that heel toe or heel instep alignment with ourself, but it also affords freedom of movement here with regards to distance of the relationship with the catcher. The last one's the heel toe relationship with the batter. And what we're gonna see in some of these clips is that our toe of the, of the slot foot should basically be lined up with the heel of the batter. The toe of our slot foot should be lined up with the heel of the batter. And that's gonna allow us to be more aggressive in the slot. We'll see some examples and talk our way through that one here. Now remember, we wanna build it from the ground up. So as we talked about with our pre-pitch uh, routine, that preset, we focused a lot on the footwork. And the first step was always setting our feet first and then getting set or dropping into our stance. So in our presets, remember, we wanna make sure that we are maintaining those relationships, those heel-toe relationships, step in with the slot foot first, then the drop foot so that we are more aggressive in the slot. Now, the last thing to go ahead and talk about here with regards to building it from the ground up is obviously the width of our stance. We don't wanna be so wide or so narrow that our balance is off or that our mobility is off too. Our transfer of weight should not be side to side because we're so wide. Uh, it should basically be up and out so that we can go ahead and be mobile as well. And remember, there are three of those heel-toe relationships, one with ourself, our catcher, and then ultimately the batter, so that as we see here, we are, per, we are positioned more aggressively in the slot. Let's take a look at some examples here um, of some, some umpires doing some really good work here with regards to um, the building stance from the bottom up. Okay, so a great look at this umpire here in this freeze frame, just in a, in a, in a great stance here. We talked about heel-toe relationship with the hitter. We'll see here that this umpire's slot foot, in this case, it is the, the, the left foot of the umpire here, lined up with the heel, okay, and the batter obviously stepped because he, he stepped with the pitch. Uh, you can see the heel instep method here with, the, with this umpire stance as well. He affords freedom of movement with the catcher. And we'll see a back view of him too, where that distance to the catcher also affords freedom of movement as well. As we kind of watch this umpire, notice how consistent he is in this stance in building it from the ground up. Again, take a look at his feet. They are heel toe with himself. They are heel toe with the catcher, which we'll see in just a second. And again, it is heel toe with the batter. Notice that the slot foot, in this case, is the umpire's right foot on the left-handed hitter. This one then is lined up with the batter's heel, which positions them, him then in the slot, that fluid midpoint between the inside of the catcher and in the batter. And again, this is all a product then of what we do in between pitches, uh, like we already talked about with our presets. Okay, really good look here at this umpire. Now, I told you, showed you I'd show you the back view of this one. Again, a great look here at heel-toe relationship. Remember, heel toe with the batter, that slot foot is aligned with the batter's heel, so we're in a good slot position, that fluid midpoint between the hitter and the catcher. Uh, we've got a good heel toe relationship with ourself um, so that we can have good depth perception on the strike zone, and we see it down and through the zone. And then lastly, we've got freedom of movement for the catcher. We're not all the way up on him, but at the same time, we're not too far back to distort our own vision of the strike zone and the outer edge uh, if we ended up getting too far back. So a great look here at this umpire executing some of these fundamentals of building things from the, from the ground up. And again, this is all a product of how we step in in that preset. Now, I also mentioned that we don't want the width of our stance to affect our mobility. Uh, here you've got an umpire who does a really good job of positioning in the slot. He just may be too wide. And if you take a look at like how he comes up out of his stance, uh, sometimes he appears to kind of be anchor-legged, if you will. So we don't want to be so wide in our stance that we aren't as mobile as we may, may otherwise need to be. Remember, we don't want that transition of weight to be side to side. We want that to be up and out. That way we're more mobile here. And again, we don't want to get so wide that we may be lock-legged. 
Now, at the same time, this umpire does exhibit a lot of consistent fundamentals, which puts him in great position to see pitches. Uh, he is in the slot and things like that. Just maybe a little bit too wide where he is not as mobile as we may otherwise want to go ahead and see. And if you take a look here, uh, when the catcher hands him the baseball on the last out of the inning, he's kind of got to shift that weight from side to side, which may make us late to get out and rotate or, or whatever else the case may be. Likewise, we don't necessarily want to be too narrow. Uh, if we get too narrow, a lot of times here, our balance can be off, whether it's in our stance uh, as the pitch comes in or as we're required to move after the pitch. Uh, again, uh, we just want to make sure that we are as mobile as we can be, um, and we don't want to let our stance basically take us out of that mobility. So again, kind of the second step here is to make sure that we are um, you know, mobile enough um, within our, the width of our stance, and then obviously we're building that from the ground up. So step number one, what do we do pre-pitch? Is it consistent so that we have consistent perception of the zone? And then secondly, uh, when we start, start to take a look at our feet positioning, we got to maintain those three relationships here uh, with heel-toe. Number one, heel-toe with ourself. Secondly, heel-toe with the catcher. And lastly, heel-toe with the hitter. DJ, anything in the chat here for us so far? Eric made a good point, just uh, reiterating the importance of making sure that the steps that you take are consistent and easy, uh, easily able to repeat. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, in working with a lot of young umpires, um, you know, we, we can talk about being positioned in a slot and head height and tracking and this, that, and the other. The number one thing that I oftentimes try and focus on, particularly at umpire school and when I'm working with anyone, is just let's get them consistent in stepping into position, into that slot. And then, like everything else, head height, uh, tracking, and things like that can come from there. Now, yes, those things are important. But again, to Eric's point and to, to the point that's being made here, if we can't step in consistently, then we're not going to have a shot at a consistent strike zone. And we can fix all that other stuff uh, on down the road. So stepping in that pre-pitch routine and that footwork, I think, two really fundamental things for us to think about for us individually as we try and get better here in 2021. And then even as we're instructing some things to think about, too, um, as we continue on down the road. Now, the last one here, uh, or one of the other things here to think about in, in how we set up is the upper body here. And we, we talk about our shoulders in this case. And I made this point earlier. If we get too pronounced with the heel-toe relationship uh, and try and work like what's called the super slot, where we're kind of trying more angled towards the outside corner, I think a softball calls it like, um, oh, I can't remember. Seth, you may remember this term, where you're square to the outside corner as opposed to the outside release to the, to the release point of the hitter. Um, a lot of times what that does is it distorts the outer edge, our perception of the outer edge. Uh, and we didn't necessarily find that out until a lot of people started to use what's called the colored plate drill. Um, I'm sure some of you guys may have seen our videos from the central region on the colored plate drill and other people do the, the colored plate drills too. I mean, realistically, we stole it from, from, from other training advices as well. But what we saw is that people who worked that super slot, that more pronounced heel toe relationship, oftentimes kind of had a distortion of the outer edge. They weren't tracking the ball or they were seeing the ball as one color when the overhead camera actually showed it otherwise. So what we found here is that oftentimes that is because of the squareness of our upper body. And rather than being square with good pelvic alignment, as GPA is the term from softball, rather than being trying to be squared to the outer edge and having like a pronounced uh, squareness to the outer edge, we wanna be squared to the release point of the pitcher um, so that we don't necessarily lose depth perception on the outer edge. And DJ, I'll let you kind of talk about your experience here in a second uh, during one of our, our clinics here with Jose Matamoros and what he kind of talked to you about being square. Okay. But if we take a look at this clip here uh, of this umpire, he does a really good job of making sure, number one, that his, his cadence is, is definitely what it needs to be, but he is definitely square to the to the release point of the pitcher. Uh, he's got a great slot positioning, good mechanics. This is a really strong, uh, really strong umpire here that we see um, with regards to those fundamentals. DJ, anything else to add in there about uh, your, your adjustment here with being square to the outer edge? Yeah, um, the the only thing is it's it's a matter of inches, honestly. But um, the, and the, honestly, I I can try and look for it and link it in the chat. Um, but there's a, just a really good video of just kind of using that GPA and focusing towards the outside corner of the plate. Um, but I was just mis missing pitches terribly, not even knowing it. But like. I would say, but probably three or four, maybe even more on the outside corner. Uh, but they were coming into me um, uh, accurately, uh, made a turn and squared to the release point of the pitcher, like maybe a turn of two to three inches on my upper body. And it changed like the very next pitch it changed. So um, it's the matter of inches and making sure that you're squared to the release point of the pitcher um, is, is incredibly important. I'll try and uh, do some searching here. 
uh, for that clip. And I can link that uh, colored plate drill in the chat just to just to kind of see because Jose gives a lot of really good uh, uh, input and feedback and teaching in that clip as well. So the last step here to talk about in our pre-pitch routine here, uh, so we've kind of gone through three. Number one, what do we do in between pitches? How are we stepping in consistently? Secondly, our footwork, making sure that we have those three heel-toe relationships. Third one we just talked about was the upper body, as DJ just mentioned, being square to the release point to the pitcher. And then lastly, we obviously want to be set at the proper time so that we're not drifting and we're not moving as the pitch comes in. Now, the goal here of being set at the proper time is that we want to be set or we want to be locked in. A lot of people use that word, locked in, uh, by the time the pitcher's free foot comes back down and hits the ground. So we want to be set or locked in by the time the free foot comes back and hits the ground. So we, we are going to kind of go through this progression of how exactly we should kind of get set at the proper time. Number one, step in with that slot foot first. Remember, that allows us to be more aggressive. When do we want to step in with the slot foot? Well, if you remember from the clips, we saw them all step in as the pitcher towed the rubber. And we'll show some examples of that one here in a second. Now, once the slot foot is set, once the uh, pitcher tows the rubber, you can set your drop foot, okay? So you can set your drop foot second. Again, setting the slot foot before the drop foot is important because that makes us more aggressive in the slot, that midpoint between the hitter and the batter. Once the pitcher gets into the set position or raises the free foot, raises that non-pivot foot to begin the delivery, you can sink down into your stance. And remember that we wanna be set by the time that free foot comes back down and hits the ground to deliver the pitch. That way we're set while the ball is in flight from the pitcher to the glove, okay? Now, some of you guys may ask what happens if the catcher adjusts. Well, remember, we adjust. So remember, the slot is a fluid midpoint between the hitter and the uh, catcher. Now, do you have to adjust? No, you don't necessarily have to adjust, but as long as you maintain that midpoint, you're in good shape, and you don't want to necessarily overcompensate in the direction of the catcher uh, you'd rather probably overcompensate in the direction of the hitter. Uh, but nonetheless, if the catcher adjusts, we're going to go ahead and probably adjust with them, keeping that fluid yet relative midpoint between the hitter and the catcher. Now, the one area that we oftentimes get struggled in, I'm sure many of you guys are asking about, is if we get squeezed on the inner edge. And there's a couple, two different schools of thought. The kind of older and more um, writing principle in terms of how to deal with when, you're, when your slot is squeezed on the inside corner is to go up but stay in. We don't want to ever go towards the direction of the catcher or outside of the catcher towards the outside corner. That's not the direction we want to go. We want to stay as much as we can in between the hitter and the catcher. So if, the, if our slot gets squeezed towards the inner half, a lot of people will say to go up, which is fine. Uh, and then the second step is to kind of go back like a half step as well to get you some, uh, some vision there, at least on the inner half. And if the pitch is on the outer half, then you know that is what it is. A newer school of thought that uh, is kind of more so with concussion protocol alignment there uh, is to actually drop lower. And uh, that whole idea of head height being at the top of the catcher's head helmet kind of goes away at that point uh, because more often what you're looking for is better vision through the strikes. And that's kind of a newer age philosophy that I've heard out there. More is definitely coming about with that one with evidence and you know people's experiences. Uh, but in the older school is to kind of go up and then back if, we, if necessary if our slot is squeezed. Uh, kind of the newer theory that's being tested out there right now is actually to drop a little bit lower, uh, still in the slot. And as I mentioned here, we never want to go towards the outside. Okay, So that's what we do if the catcher adjusts. And remember, we want to make this adjustment uh, before the free foot lands. Okay, So we want to make that adjustment before the free foot lands. Again, remember, we want to stand up and relax in between pitches. Take a breath. Reset. Get your pre-pinch cadence in. Think about that foul shooter shooting foul shots. You want to be in rhythm and shoot those in. Now, let's take a look here at some of these umpires who get set at the proper time, and we'll go ahead and wrap things up here shortly thereafter. So again, set at the proper time. The goal here, as it says here on the screen, is to be set by the time the pitcher's free foot lands, to be set by the time the pitcher's free foot lands. So remember here, step number one is to be um, in, our feet have to be in position as the pitcher toes the rubber. Here, assess our umpire, feet are in proper position as the um, pitcher toes the rubber. As she goes ahead and lifts the free foot, you'll see that he sinks into his stance. He finds his lock-in mechanism before the time that the free foot lands, and then he is locked in and loaded for that entire pitch. Rick Strachey's our umpire here. Again, pitcher's on the rubber, toe in the rubber. We're going to get our feet set. And then as he goes ahead and starts his windup and lifts the free foot, we sink into our stance. Free foot goes to land. You can see that he's found a great lock-in mechanism and does a great job there. Okay. Again, same fundamentals here. Hey, Stu, sorry, not to interrupt, but I have a question. Go ahead, no. Um, also, uh, kind of what DJ was saying, when you guys were talking about squaring um, squaring up with the pitcher's release point, DJ, I think you like, you know, squaring up your upper body. So, sorry if I missed it, but so do you square up by just kind of like 
turning uh, you know, your, your chest or your upper body, uh, or are you moving your feet in order to then do that? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I think so. Building, you know, a great question from the stance up from the from the feet up is essentially what we're, we're building that squareness to the release point of. So like um, probably one thing and I can go back to this clip here in just a second. One thing you may have seen in the umpire who demonstrated some really good uh, fundamentals with being square is that his 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 drop foot, the one closest to the catcher, was kind of flared down the line. And then that kind of squared him up naturally from his lower body up to the release point of the pitcher. So to, to an extent, yes, we talk about being square with our shoulders, uh, but remember our feet have got to maintain that heel toe relationship or that heel instep relationship first. Now we don't need to like turn our body to where we're uncomfortable because if we're uncomfortable, we have absolutely no shot at calling a great strike zone. But definitely that squareness is, is something that should be consistent. And yes, we talked about it with our upper body, but it should be consistent with the entire body, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Question? Thank you. Yep. That answer it, Noah? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, cool. Last one here to look at here in terms of being set at the proper time is uh, using that that hands on knees. Um, look here. So our hands are on our knees here. Pitcher's toe in the rubber, so feet are set. Catcher adjusts, so we readjust. The free foot's up, so now we're starting to sink into our stance. We are locked in by the time the pitcher gets his, his drop foot down. And the pitch is down in the strike zone. Same deal here. Okay, pitcher has just now lift his free foot. We come up off of hands on knees, reset with the catcher. By the time that pitcher puts his his drop foot, I'm sorry, his not his free foot back down, we should be set. And that's exactly what happens in this clip. Okay. Now here's some some clips of some guys basically trying to set too early. You can see how this probably gives us some uh, instability in our stance. But not only does it create some instability, but it can also create some tunnel vision here as well. Uh, and then setting too late can sometimes cause us to drift. So setting at the proper time, really, really important here for us uh, to think about as well. Um, and, and when we want to make sure here, as we saw here, that we are set by the time the free foot lands, except by the time that the free foot lands. Um, Noah, this is a really good look here at, at this still shot of this umpire in this picture. You can kind of see how his, his drop foot um, back here is kind of angled down towards the line and how his whole body, legs, uh, shoulders, waist, and everything else are square more so to the release point than they are the outer edge. This is a good still shot here just randomly where it's at. Uh, for us to make sure that we, we see that point that you asked about, about being square uh, to the release point. Last thing here to go ahead and talk about real quick, and then we're, we're, we're done here, is, is just to make sure that we review. And again, this is our pre-pitch cadence. I didn't get to proper use of eyes, so we'll have to uh, table that for next week as part two here of our strike zone strategy. But again, a couple of real important things for us to think about. Number one, what do you do pre-pitch? In between pitches, what do you do and is it consistent? And if it's not consistent, then that's something to work for and work towards. And again, as you're working with some younger umpires and they're trying to build good habits, um, you know, worry less about head height and, and tracking and things like that, and rather get them set into the right spot and then build that stance from the ground up. So what are we doing pre-pitch? Is it consistent? Because that's what gives us the best chance to be successful at calling a fair and accurate strike zone. Remember, we talked about footwork in those three relationships, self with heel toe or heel instep the catcher to afford freedom of movement. Remember, we don't want to be any closer than the heel um, um, of the catcher with uh, the toe of our slot foot. And then the batter, remember, we want to align so that we're aggressive in the slot. Our slot foot's toe should be aligned with the batter's heel. So those are the three heel-toe relationships that we should ma maintain. Upper body and total body then should be square to the release point of the pitcher. And then we're set at the proper time that we are locked in before the pitcher then plants that free foot. And again, those are kind of the four basic strategies in our pre-pitch routine that we've really got to fight for every single pitch. Uh, and in doing so, the rest will come together. Now, the second piece of this conversation of strike zone strategy is what we do with our eyes in pitch. So today, kind of focus more so on the pre-pitch stuff. Uh, and then next week when we start to move on, we'll take a look then at proper use of eyes in pitch and how these two, our pre-pitch strategy, our pre-pitch cadence, and then the proper use of eyes combine together to basically formulate a, a, our strike zone strategy. And remember, that strike zone strategy uh, is our action plan to go ahead and call a fair and accurate strike zone, a fair and accurate strike zone. Questions here uh, before we go ahead and wrap up. Anything to touch base with here or anything like that in the chat, DJ, or anything there? Nothing, uh, nothing too crazy. Gary brought up some good points, but I told him we'd post game it after we finish this, uh, this whole session. Cool. 
All righty. Well, a couple things here in closing. Uh, first of all, once again, thank you for your attention. I know that there were a lot of things that were thrown out there. Um, and I think a lot of things are definitely things that we probably heard before and have been instructed before. But at the same time, as we start to help out other folks um, and as we start to you know, think about 2021 as the year to get back to fundamentals and, and to rebuild those habits, I think it's important to kind of put into perspective a lot of those things and how uh, integral they are at us actually being able to call a fair and accurate strike zone. And we're going to see that piece together more theoretically uh, as we talk about uh, strike zone strategy and proper use of eyes next week. So uh, I think it's a really good building block. And as I mentioned and trying to say throughout the day here today, you know, there are a lot of things out there for us to talk about today. Uh, you talked, mentioned head height, slot positioning, footwork, pre-pitch cadence and things of that nature. You really only want to take a look at one or two of those things and try and fix them and make them a habit before moving on to something else. So don't try and do everything at once because you'll find yourself starting to unravel and all of a sudden you're not comfortable and your strike zone probably will end up stinking anyway. So pick one or two of those things to focus on and, and get better at and improve here uh, as you go ahead and head back onto the diamond. Um, last thing here for me, uh, we, we've got that that um, uh, the feedback form, post game feedback form that's been circulating out throughout the around the region. Uh, several people have filled that out, and I appreciate that one. It's starting to give us a list of some things to think about and focus on in our trainings. Uh, so we'll pump that back out in the recap video, uh, email here as well. So please continue to fill that one out. Just trying to see number one, what are you working on? Secondly, uh, how's it going? And thirdly, what are you struggling with? So be on the lookout for that post game feedback form as well. And then, uh, as I mentioned at the start, tough week for everybody in Little League players, uh, umpires, volunteers everywhere. So rally around each other, support each other, be there for one another, uh, and realize that you know, as, as, as disappointing as it is that we don't have uh, five of our seven tournaments at the end of the year, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in with good reason. People are making good decisions for the, for the betterment uh, of young people, um, and that's just kind of where we have to be. So appreciate everybody here being here. Remember, part two of this series is next week. We'll take a look then at proper use of eyes in our strike zone strategy. Appreciate everyone being here. Looking forward to next week. We'll see you then. Thanks for being here, everyone.